When it comes to choosing your PhD supervisor, topic fit matters, credentials matter. But you've also got to remember that during your PhD, you are going to cry, you are going to spiral, you are going to send weird emails at two o'clock in the morning. And the person on the other end of that needs to be somebody who doesn't make you feel like a complete failure for being a messy human doing a difficult thing. So let's walk through 10 brutally honest tips for choosing your supervisor. If we've not met before, hi, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Yardley, and I am here to help you realize that completing your PhD is a process. There's no big secret. It's a process made up of a lot of little things, little wins, little steps. And here on this channel, I'm walking with you as you take them one at a time. So choosing a PhD supervisor, let's get into it. Their vibe matters as much as their CV. Everyone tells you to pick a PhD supervisor based on their academic record, their CV, their publication list, their research reputation. And yes, that's part of it. That is an important part of it, but it's not everything. You're not just choosing a brain, you're choosing a human. So think about it. You'll be panicking in front of them. You'll be crying in front of them, probably freaking out and repeatedly saying that you want to quit. Those things will happen during your PhD journey. You'll be navigating all the feelings, self-doubt, imposter syndrome, burnout. So this person is going to see you at your wobbliest. So ask yourself, do I feel safe with this person? Can I bring an authentic version of myself to this relationship and not be made to feel bad for that? Do I feel that I can be honest with this person and still be respected? If their emails give you anxiety, if they come across as cold or arrogant or uninterested, run. You don't need a PhD supervisor who is going to make you feel like an idiot just for being human. So you might end up going for someone who doesn't have 100 publications and 20 years of experience. You might go for someone a little less experienced, but you do need to watch the newbie supervisors a little bit, the people who've never supervised anybody before. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have someone on your supervisory team who hasn't supervised a PhD before, because this is how we learn, okay, through actually doing PhD supervision. So I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that you need to be very wary of having someone like that as your first supervisor, as your main supervisor. Because there are some newbie supervisors who are, how do I put this, a little bit overzealous. Now they mean well, they really do. But you might feel a little bit overwhelmed if your supervisor is constantly sending you things to read, like all the time, multiple times a week. And if when you send them a draft, it comes back with so many tweaks and so many changes and, and so many trap changes where they've moved things around that you're like, oh, your work just becomes ineligible. Now, the reason that they're doing this is because they're trying to prove themselves as a supervisor. They really are trying to do a good job. And some new supervisors often feel that the more they do, the better a supervisor they are. The more stuff they send you to read, the more changes and comments that they give you on your drafts, all the better. But from my experience of working with many, many PhD students, the opposite is true, okay? When you get a piece of work back that is absolutely covered in stuff, your immediate reaction is very often, oh, goodness me, this must have been a terrible piece of work that it's come back with all of this stuff on it. It's not a terrible piece of work. It's possibly that you've got a supervisor who's kind of trying a bit too hard. So that is a potential issue with super new supervisors. So just be aware of that. Next up, a topic match doesn't necessarily equal a perfect match. So here we're talking about research interests. And yes, you want someone who broadly gets your topic. If you're researching digital activism and their specialist topic is Victorian literature, that's probably not gonna work. But you don't need a perfect clone. Would you rather work with someone who kind of gets your topic but completely gets you or someone who's a perfect topic match, but really makes you feel small and makes you feel stupid every time you talk to them. So it's not just about the topic. There are other things you need to take into consideration when you're thinking about if this person is a good fit for you. 
So what kind of methodologies do they work with? What kind of theoretical approach are they coming from? And what are their core values about research? It's not about being identical, it's about being compatible. Before we get on to the next point, I wanna hear from you in the comments. If you're currently looking around for a supervisor, what problems are you coming up against? If you're a bit further along in your PhD journey, what do you wish people would have told you about supervision before you got started? And I really want to urge those people to share in the comments. Your experience and your knowledge are going to be so helpful for people who are a little bit earlier in their PhD process, so get typing. Next up, check their track record in terms of the students that they've supervised. Are their students, you know, okay? Here's where you need to put your detective hat on. Don't just read your potential supervisor's bio, actually investigate. How many students have they successfully supervised to completion? Are these students still in touch with their supervisor? Or do they look like they've come out of a five year battle? If they've had five students drop out, or none of their students have graduated in like the last decade, that is not a good sign. And don't be afraid to reach out to one of their past or current students and ask them something like this. Hi, I'm considering working with this supervisor and I'm just wondering how you found the supervision experience. You will be amazed at what people tell you, but make sure that you reach out to a few people because even the best supervisors have had students that they haven't you know, clicked with, or students they've fallen out with, or students who've just flounced out and said, I don't wanna be supervised by that person anymore. It happens. So if you hear one horror story, don't stop there, keep digging. You want to get a fair and rounded understanding of this supervisor, and you'll need to hear more than one story to do that. Academic celebrities. Proceed with caution. Now, let's talk about the big names. You know who I'm talking about. These people are the keynote speaker at all of the big conferences. They've published in all the high impact journals. They've got a social media presence like an influencer. But here's the thing. Are they actually around? Are they actually available? Do they have any capacity whatsoever? Are you actually going to be supervised by this person or are you just going to end up as a name on their list of supervisees? If they're always traveling or on sabbatical or juggling 14 funded projects, chances are you'll be lucky to get an email reply before your next birthday. And if you're drawn to someone high profile, that is absolutely fine, but just check these things. Have they got time? Are they genuinely interested in supervising you? Are they going to be working with a reliable second supervisor or co-supervisor who can pick up the slack when they get a bit busy? Now we're going to get on to second supervisors in a while, so stay tuned for that. Before you commit, before you sign on the dotted line, meet them. I cannot stress this enough. Do not commit to a supervisor you have never spoken to. This is your vibe check moment. Email them, set up a time to chat, whether that is on Zoom, whether that's a face-to-face -face meeting, this is so important. And if they're not prepared to do that, that tells you everything you need to know. And if you can get some time with them, do they make space for you to talk? Are they genuinely interested in you? Are they listening to what you say? Or do they just kind of like the sound of their own voice? Do they ask you, thoughtful and meaningful questions about your research. You will know within a few minutes whether this is going to work out. And if it's not going to work out, it's better that you know that now than when you are six months into your PhD or a year or two years because it's a bit late then. In that chat, ask them how many students they're currently supervising. This is such a simple question but it tells you so much. Some supervisors take on way too many students. And when that happens, people fall through the cracks. They do, it's a thing. Emails don't get responded to, drafts don't get checked, and people are just left out there in the wilderness wondering what on earth is going on. So ask them directly 
how many PhD students they're currently looking after. And if they can't give you an answer to that, that is not a good sign. Now, I get it, they might not know exactly right off the top of their head there and then because people complete, people have interruptions in their studies, people take breaks, so they might think, oh, it might be five, it might be six, or, or it might be seven, it might be eight, that's fine. But if they sit there kind of counting on their fingers and going through people's names, not a good sign. This is really important because PhD supervision can often become less urgent than other things they've got on their plate because, let's be honest, you're not in their face every day. Other people are. So if you've got an academic who's overwhelmed, it's easiest if they attend to the person who's shouting loudest at them. And they might let comments on your draft chapter drift a bit for a few weeks, a few months, and you don't want that. You deserve better than that. Next up, don't forget the second supervisor. Here's one that people often forget. Your second supervisor might end up being your PhD saviour. So if your main supervisor goes away or goes off on sick or is difficult to get hold of, your second supervisor could really be the one who keeps you afloat. So ask who your second supervisor is likely to be. And how are they going to divide up the responsibility of supervising you? Are there any particular tasks that the second supervisor will do, that the first supervisor will do? What is that arrangement going to look like? And second supervisors, they can be a sounding board. They can give you a fresh perspective. And quite frankly, they can simply make you feel less alone. Never underestimate the power of a good second supervisor. Know what you need and be really honest with yourself here. Are you someone who needs deadlines, who needs structure, who needs regular formal supervision meetings? Or do you prefer to work independently and just check in occasionally? If you are a chaotic creative who thrives on messy drafts and brainstorming and shiny object syndrome, a super structured supervisor who only wants polished perfectionist drafts is probably not the best person for you. That is not going to end well. Similarly, if you are quite a structured and organised and rigid and quite regimented person, you don't want a supervisor who's a bit of a free spirit who kind of drifts in and out and is not going to give you the stability that you need. Know what you need and choose someone who supports that. Feedback style matters. Do you prefer long detailed comments with references and suggestions when it comes to draft work? Or do you prefer a few notes and a quick chat? Can you handle a supervisor being quite blunt or quite direct? Or do you need a little bit of encouragement and a bit more positivity mixed in? You are going to be very emotionally attached to your writing. So your supervisor's approach, your supervisor's tone when it comes to feedback, all of that stuff matters. So you need to ask them about how they feed back to their students. Because you need to find a supervisor who is going to give you feedback in a way that will help you grow, not spiral and cry. So when you meet them, ask them, how do you usually give feedback to your students? Now, if that person responds by saying something like this, well, how do you like to learn best? Do you prefer comments on your drafts via track changes? Or would you prefer a voice note or to sit down and go through it in person? If that is their response, that supervisor is a keeper. If they're asking you questions about how you like to learn, if they're asking you questions about your needs and your preferences, they're a good one. Remember, you are allowed to be choosy. You don't have to pick the first supervisor who says yes. You're not difficult if you ask questions. You're not demanding if you want a supportive supervisor. These are all perfectly reasonable things that you should be doing in your search for a supervisor. You are going to spend three to six years working with this person. You're sharing your ideas, your time, your energy, your, your thoughts, you're being quite vulnerable at times with this person. That is not a small deal, so you are allowed to be choosy. So don't settle and don't be dazzled by people's titles. And don't ignore the red flags because you feel you should be grateful that this person's agreed to supervise you. You bring value to the table too, so act like it. And when you approach it in this way, 
you are setting an expectation for that supervision relationship before you've even got started. And that is a really good thing, okay? Because if your supervisor is clear that you are not to be messed with, that you're somebody who values your time, you're someone who respects yourself, you're somebody who's not gonna be fobbed off with excuses or delays, that is a really good thing. They know this is a student I need to look after. This is a student who is gonna call me out on my bad behavior if I behave badly with them. So from the beginning, setting that expectation, being clear about what you need, what they can offer you, that is setting a really good time for the future. Popping up on your screen right now is another video you might find helpful if you're in the process of shopping for a supervisor because you're quite likely going through the process of preparing a research proposal too. This video takes you through the process of preparing that proposal step by step. I cover the four key things that you need to make sure you include in your research proposal. So go and check that out. I'll see you in there.